uh, aims to mobilize EU citizens uh, to vote at the local elections uh, on the 6th of May. Uh, for many EU citizens, this could be the last time uh, that they can vote. And uh, this is a right that uh, we think is very important. And that's what we want to uh, encourage EU citizens to exercise this right and to register to vote and then vote uh, on the 6th of May. Uh, as part of this campaign, we are organizing uh, three hustings uh, in Northampton, in Corby and Peterborough. And when I was organizing these hustings, uh, some people asked, uh, why are we organizing hustings uh, in these parts of, of, of the UK? But the reason is that um, uh, outside of London, uh, which has a very high proportion of EU citizens, uh, Northamptonshire and Peterborough are one of the, the areas which has a proportionally high uh, EU citizen um, population. Uh, and also in these areas, unfortunately, EU citizens are not uh, politically active. Uh, many of them have not registered to vote. And essentially, we would like to change that. We would like to mobilize EU citizens to vote uh, and to register. Having said that, uh, the hustings tonight uh, is uh, open to all. Uh, it's not only for EU citizens. Uh, before I would give the floor to our moderator, Nicholas Hutton, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Robert. Uh, Robert is an EU citizen. He is from uh, Romania. Uh, and he's a student at uh, Northampton University. And uh, he's also a volunteer for the Three Millions uh, Young European Network. And we asked him to say a few words about uh, why young people, uh, young European uh, citizens in the UK should vote and why voting matters to them. Robert, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Andras. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for all those of you who are watching on Zoom, and thank you to everyone coming across on Facebook. Um, like Andras has said, my name is Rob. I am 19, and I am a student. I was originally born in Romania, uh, but I came to the UK at the age of 10, and we moved to Northampton in 2014. Now, the reason why for me and for many people, uh, many European people, uh, it is so important to vote in these local elections is that many of us find this as our home and many of us want to place roots here. And so there are many local issues to us which are very valuable, such as housing. Housing is a very important uh, issue, not only for young people across the country and the lack of affordable housing, but also for EU citizens who aren't as young, who are maybe my mother's age, who want to place roots and to um, become fully settled in this country. I think that's an issue that affects many people. Similarly, um, for me, as a young person, education is also very important. In Northampton, we have a host of schools, many of them rural, many of them urban schools, uh, state comprehensive, which are not doing really great. For example, my past school, Elizabeth Woodville School, they couldn't run many programs that they wanted to, and that many students wanted to run, for example, French. And languages are critical to developing an understanding of the world. And so those courses should be funded, which is why I had to move to Northampton School for Boys, an ex-grammar school. And really, I shouldn't have had to make that choice. I shouldn't have had to move to an ex-grammar school. Or many people from state comprehensive shouldn't have to make the choice uh, between going to a local school and going to another school which is further in order to get a quality education. So education is obviously very important to me as well. And similarly, uh, Northamptonshire County Council was on the news over the past few years uh, due to its, um, how should I say, misappropriation of funds, and which has led to further cuts than were already in place at the national level. And I think the provision of services such as care and um, social services of that nature are also very important in the local area. And so why you should get involved is we don't want to ensure that, sorry, we want to ensure that those things do not happen again. And so that is why I will vote. And that is why I think it will be very important from people um, of the same background with me 
uh, to also vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. It's very interesting. Uh, now I'm going to give the floor to Nicolas Hutton. Uh, Nicolas is the co-founder and CEO of the Three Million, and uh, he is going to moderate the the discussion tonight. Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andras, and uh, welcome to everyone, to all the watchers on Facebook and those uh, who are uh, on Zoom. Uh, if you got any questions for the candidates, which I'm going to introduce in a moment, uh, ask them either in the Q&A or in uh, the comments in Facebook. So firstly, I'd like to, uh, to send an apology. Uh, David Summers of uh, the Dothampton Chronicle was meant to be chairing as I am now, uh, but uh, he was preventing from doing so. So uh, he sent his apology and uh, but we're very uh, grateful that uh, the Northampton Chronicle actually published the event and uh, made sure that uh, there was a good circulation. So today we got uh, four speakers uh, or four candidates for these elections. I uh, just want to, uh, to uh, I think, and I'm not wrong saying is for West Northamptonshire Council elections to be extremely precise. Uh, in alphabetical order, we got Daniel Stone from the Labour Party, Jonathan Nunn from the Constitutive Party and current uh, uh, leader of the council, Katie Simpson, trade unionist and socialist coalition, and then Stuart Trolley, uh, Tolley, uh, Liberal Democrats. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of the candidates in that order to introduce themselves for maybe two or three minutes maximum. And then uh, we'll ask, uh, I'll relay the questions from the audience. Some of them are being asked during the registration process, and then we'll take it from there, and uh, we'll be, we should be finished around six o'clock. So, uh, Daniel first. Daniel, we can't hear you. You're That's mute. because I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I was saying thank you for organising the Hustings. I'm absolutely delighted because I think it's um, high time that politicians engage with our Eastern European communities and, um, and made a much better connection with them. So thank you very much for that. So my name is Danielle Stone. My Romanian name is Solomon Ica. My grandfather was a very famous Romanian poet, Alexander. I don't speak Romanian, all my Eastern European heritage, which includes uh, the Czech Republic, is lost to me. But I am a very passionate uh, European, I have to say. And I marched on the people's vote uh, for um, another vote. And I regret the fact that we have left the European Union. And I also regret that when we were making that decision, we excluded from the vote European colleagues who are in this country, and we excluded from the vote uh, British people who are leaving elsewhere in Europe. I don't think that was the right thing to do. And we also excluded young people, um, and it's their future. So I, I regret that. But I think we are where we are, and we always have to make the very best of where we are. So I think the struggle to improve life in Britain continues. I want to see um, our Eastern European colleagues much more settled here. I think they should be given the option to become British citizens without the huge, enormous amounts of money it costs at the moment. Um, and I would like to uh, see their contribution properly recognised and valued. I'm very, very interested to see what's going to happen in these local elections. I think in Northamptonshire, We've been served extremely badly over the last few years by a county that went bankrupt twice. And we've also been badly served by a borough which lost us nearly £17 million in a, in a loan fiasco, as we call it. But more than that, what I see all around me is people hurting, lots of poverty, lots of uh, people in housing need, lots of people in unsatisfactory jobs, and as Robert said, you know, we've got issues around children's services and adult social care. So I'm really looking forward to the election to see how people want to take things forward and how they're going to be voting. Is that okay for an introduction? Daniel, thank you very much. That's a great introduction. 
So next, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan of the Constitutive Party to uh, introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And um, very briefly, in, in similar style, following uh, Danielle, I, um, um, I think actually what I'm talking to is, is probably an audience of Northamptonians. Let, let's make that absolutely clear first. There's never mind anything about who is different. Actually, we're all the same. If you live here, you are part of our Northampton community. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is, is not general. We haven't got a general election coming up. Bre Brexit is what it is. I, that whether, whether you voted for it or against it, actually, it's there. But what you've got is an opportunity to shape your local area um, coming up. And I, say, I suppose I'd say two or three different things and, and possibly I would shape this uh, picking up on the earlier priorities raised, those of homes, education and uh, and to some extent difficulties of the past and I'll address those Danielle's just just referenced those o on homes look at what the Conservatives have done in Northampton over the last few years we have built more homes this council built 20 uh, sorry I think it was about 10 or 12 homes in 20 years uh, we have built uh, 200 we have another uh, 300 on site and we have another 500 about to start work so that building homes which is absolutely crucial there is a need for for homes however long you've been in Northamptonian there is a need for no more homes and we are already on a 10-year plan to build a thousand homes we're way exceeding the delivery of that on education there is a need for ed education county services have been underfunded in our manifesto coming forward we're making a commitment to further invest in secondary schools and improve the quality and the capacity um, of those of those schools now things have happened in the past i wasn't at the county council that they made decisions they wanted to outsource things and actually um uh, you know, I don't think those things worked. So we are where we are. I'm not sure I'm terribly keen on going unitary. We've got to make the best of it. What it will bring is efficiencies in bringing services together. Likewise, at the council, as, as Danielle mentioned, predecessors of mine let money to the football club. The processes were inadequate, wholly inadequate. And that's why when the loan wasn't repaid, it's been extremely difficult to recover the money. But what you've seen on both of those councils is a journey of reinvention to a council that was effectively bankrupt at, at NCC, at the county council, now having in the region of £100 million reserve, which is a pretty healthy level of reserve to have to move into um, the start of this new council uh, that's coming. And, 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 and Daniel will know she's, she's more part of this. At, at the Borough Council, the criticism was for the decisions taken and for the administration. Uh, of, of loan paperwork, there's been a transformation in the level of governance there. And uh, not only in the level of governance to look after the careful spending of public money, which is now cor uh, corrected, but actually also in the ambition ramping up. I've only got about 30 seconds left. I will quickly tell you that in the last few years, the ambition that we have has tackled significantly with homelessness issues, uh, has with the environment declared the climate emergency, a carbon reduction strategy, and already seen a 45% decrease in the carbon output uh, around the town. Uh, on the economy, significant business supports and grants, and an increase in the availability of high speed and gigabit uh, broadband. Perhaps regeneration of the town with our master plan, the museum about to open, the Vulcan Works business units about to open, the money now secured to improve the market square, um, and a whole raft, raft of cultural development projects, I believe we've got momentum now for Northampton and we hope to better continue to take that forward into this new West Northamptonshire. Thanks, Nicholas. Hope I didn't overrun there at all. Well, done, that's <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so next I give the floor to Katie Simpson of the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition. Katie, please. Thanks, Nicholas. And uh, thanks for inviting me along. I know sometimes um, with smaller organisations and uh, and candidates who are standing independently, it's quite hard to get positions on the panel. I didn't have any problem with that for this, so thank you very much. Um, so my name's Katie Simpson and I'm standing in Castle Ward for the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition. Um, I'm a, a team leader in a care home. Um, I'm a member of Unison Trade Union and I'm a member of the Socialist Party of England and Wales. Um, it's going to be largely speaking on a personal capacity here because of the nature of the, the way that uh, the, the Trade Unions and Socialist Coalition is constructed. Um, it's lots of different groups of people um, who stand on a, a basic platform um, of being against cuts and against austerity, against privatisation. Um, so a lot of what I'm saying will come under more of a, a, an individual position. However, um, the, those kind of basic foundations of what uh, the Trade Unions and Socialist Coalition stand for um, will kind of come through in what I'm saying. Um, so the, the organisation itself, is, it began in 2010. Um, we stepped back 
when Corbyn uh, got leadership of the Labour Party in, in order to support him. Um, I uh, didn't vote for, uh, I, I, I voted to leave the EU and um, this was a position that many um, in the Tusk organisation took simply because the EU is is, is not a representative of, of the working class of Europe. Um, we see it as a, a bosses club um, interested in the interests of the capitalist class. Um, we didn't support having a second referendum. We found that very divisive and, and actually um, we, we feel that that was the reason that uh, Corbyn was unsuccessful, one of the main reasons he was unsuccessful in the general election. Um, and that's why we're standing again uh, now that Corbyn is no longer leader of the Labour Party. Um, in terms of the local um, issues, I think most of the stuff I was going to talk about is going to is going to come up in in the discussion anyway. Um, but one of the things that we're we're focusing on locally is housing. It's a massive issue. Um, we've seen loads of empty homes around Northampton, and we think that those should be taken into public ownership. Um, on the education topic, I'm going to talk a little bit about academies and how they've been um, really damaging, particularly to people who have uh, English as their second language. Um, it's failing those pupils. Um, and obviously, talking about the mismanagement of uh, funds for the council um, and how much of that has been due to um, ideas and schemes such as PFI schemes. Um, so that will be something that um, hopefully we'll be able to touch on. Um, but I, I'd like to, to thank you for, for letting me speak and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Katie. So last but not least, Stuart Tully from the Liberal Democrats, please. Uh, thank you. I'd like to echo what all the other candidates have said, which is thank you so much for organising this and for inviting us as well to, to speak on the panel. Uh, I'm Stuart Tolley. In my day job, I'm an academic and historian, uh, mainly at Oxford uh, University's Continuing Education Department. Uh, I'm also Secretary of the European Movement Northamptonshire. So this is particularly important to me because I think it is, uh, I'll echo what uh, Danielle said, that it is very important that European uh, citizens vote in the, these elections. So why am I a Liberal Democrat? Well, partly it's values. We are still the only, uh, we're pretty much now the only pro-European EU party that has a long-term aim at least to rejoin the EU or at the very least rejoin the customs union and the single market, ending the swamp of red tape inflicted by this government on businesses and restore the rights that have been taken away from all citizens, both British and EU. But I also am very passionate about local issues as well. And I believe our local approach and record uh, is, is another reason why I am particularly enthusiastic about support, uh, about standing for standing for Lib Dems. I'm standing in Kingsthorpe South in Northampton. So firstly, I think it's our values of listening. We listen, we keep in touch in between elections, not just during or up to elections. We do regular focuses and we send out surveys. We're very, we try and listen and then implement what we hear. And we also believe we have a record of competence. When we controlled the Borough Council back in over 10 years ago, we actually took it to be the most improved council in the country. So we have a record there as well. And currently four out of the 10 best local run authorities are run by the Lib Dems, make that what you will, because uh, we don't get the opportunity very often. Um, but I also think as well, is that the important thing locally is that people need to demand better. This, uh, we've already mentioned the huge amounts of debt racked up, but what that actually means is two, uh, roughly 2,400 pounds per resident is being, uh, is, is being, uh, is, is how much that debt's cost, uh, which is partly why you've had such huge ta council tax increases that you've probably arrived on your doorstep. So what we really want to do is have more voices on the council, a, more, uh, a less complacent council, one that will actually listen to the residents. So don't reward failure and try and vote for councillors that work for you, uh, and, and hopefully you'll get a more listening, caring and confident council on May the 6th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. So uh, we, now got, we, we collected some questions when people registered. Uh, more will be coming through the Q&A. So I'm going to start with one, one question and then uh, each candidate uh, got the opportunity to answer the questions. So we'll do uh, the questions by themes, a bit like question times, if you like. And, uh, and then by the end, kind of a, we'll, we'll wrap up. So each candidate will all go, also have the opportunity to come and then Robert will close the meeting as a, a young, uh, uh, a young person from Northampton. Northampton. Uh, so first, really, uh, uh, I think we uh, there's quite a lot of questions regarding uh, uh, social issues, inequalities. Uh, 
inequality seems to be increasing, uh, we've, been, we've been told, uh, locally. How would you address that at a local level? Uh, so maybe we'll start in the same order and then I'll vary the order as we, uh, as we go through the questions. So you know, talking about equality, inequalities, how would you address that locally to, uh, to, Im to improve the situation? Uh, there was also a question about food bank, uh, and uh, I know it's, it's, it is related. Uh, and you know, wh wh have you visited a food bank? What's, uh, what's your assessment of the situation locally? Uh, so, uh, Katie, to start with. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Katie. No, it's uh, Daniel. So I'll, I'll take this, and then I'll, I'll change the order. Sorry. Okay. Um, there are seven major food banks in my ward. I'm a local councillor. And it's extraordinary to me to see the huge amount of voluntary effort uh, paid in keeping those going. I, I do food deliveries for one of them, for the African Food Bank. Um, it hurts me every time I visit the food bank to think it is needed. It, we're in a rich and powerful country, shouldn't be necessary. But I'm also heartened by the huge community effort that's being made in my ward to make sure nobody does go hungry. Tackling equalities, inequalities has been a lifelong ambition of mine. It's been part of my community activism. As a counsellor, I've tried to do lots of different things. One is, I think every employer should be a living wage foundation, uh, living wage employer. That means that nobody earns money that is going to keep them poor and make them have to go to the food banks. Um, I think every local authority should have an anti-poverty strategy. We've just been asking for that at the new West North Hants Authority. In fact, we're going to be talking about it later on tonight. I think housing is an absolutely huge issue in my ward. Lots and lots of children live in really seriously overcrowded conditions. That means they can't have people home to play with them. They find it difficult to play at all. They can't find any safe space to do their homework. Um, and it's really not good enough. I think housing poverty is a really big issue. Um, and I think poverty is a structural issue. We need structural solutions to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Jonathan, do you want, can you come next, please? Yeah, yeah, glad to, thank you. Um, you know, you, you might be surprised, Danielle won't be surprised, but as, as often, I, I agree with a lot of what she says, and that's been quite a remarkable way we work together, certainly in terms of how wonderful the community is in, uh, in and around Northampton that chips in. But what most is surprised you, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the living wage as well, and tonight's the meeting, and I have to leave at six for exactly that meeting, which is about the anti-poverty strategy. I think that's something we should do. I was pleased to support that when it came to the Borough Council a little while ago, and now I think it's something we should do. We may come from different positions as to what we expect the outcome in to be, but I do think we've got a real problem with poverty, a actually moving almost on from homelessness, which has been a major problem. We've seen a lot of success. We, we for example, at the Council, night shelter in the last couple of three years have seen about 250 people go through from from rough sleeping environment through into more settled accommodation and work so i, I think that homelessness we need a new homelessness hub in the town as well uh, which will accommodate 27 people full-time without being turfed out between day centers and night shelters and so on so there's a lot of uh, actual things happening there but covid is going to catapult this as well and, and uh, i think the number of people who have job difficulties or if, if they're in you know running their own business of some sort they'll, they'll have difficulties it's, it's going to be a significant increase uh, in um in in the challenges challenges faced last night uh, last food bank i visited would, would have been in st david's i guess a few weeks ago it's marvelous to see how successfully that runs but it seems to me to be a rotten shame it also seems to me that actually what we're about is that people can be different in their approaches to life. We need above all to ensure equality of opportunity. We can't always do what people do with that opportunity, but we should make sure that whatever the nature of their background or education, or whatever it may, it may be, we'd be totally blind to anything like that, but we just have to give them what they need in order to be um, uh, safe and well. As a consequence to which we, we, we've supported a lot of new startup businesses in a lot of different ways, and we will be continuing to do that. My hope is that in the West, we'll be able to do more and more into 
terms of economic development, which will be things like jobs clubs, supporting new businesses and so on. Some of the buildings I mentioned earlier are about nurturing uh, new businesses to come forward. Housing is vitally important. You know, one of the great things about all the houses we built in the last few years is if you look at them, you, you don't see them as being, shall we say, a council house. They are a modern quality house to the same standards of any other house that you might buy elsewhere. And my view is we need to keep building them. We have been able through this council to buy a significant number of large office buildings recently, which will be converted. We're building key worker accommodation in the town. I think there's a whole bunch of things that we need to do, but without doubt, it will be a really significant problem for this new council to start to get its teeth in starting uh, from, from 1st of April. Thank you. Hope that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Katie, this time, this is really uh, your time to talk about uh, the, the issues of rising uh, inequalities and what the council should be doing. So um, inequality is overwhelmingly a class issue. Um, in this council, the, the scale of austerity measures uh, has worsened inequality. Um, and I think certainly um, cuts to some of the most vulnerable in our society has, has, has made that a lot worse. Um, I stood up uh, in, in a council session a couple of years back and, and asked, you know, why why the elderly, why uh, children uh, being targeted for, for these austerity measures? Um, and, and I don't think the living wage is enough. I think it should be a minimum of £12 per hour um, as a step towards £15 per hour. And that's not pie in the sky when you consider how much uh, other salaries have increased over this, even during the COVID period, certainly in the Houses of Parliament. Um, so I, I think uh, the the campaign for a better minimum wage um, would be a good step towards overcoming many inequality issues. Um, inequality in, in this in this area in, in, in Northampton has been a massive issue for people from Eastern Europe. Um, and we've seen that with uh, with what happened at the Green Corps factory. You know, these are these are low paid workers who are having to live in uh, shared accommodation where it's very difficult to be socially distancing from each other and even more difficult if you have to um, uh, isolate within your home. And then you consider that that factory was hit so hard by the COVID crisis, not because of people not following the rules, as was uh, shamefully put by uh, Lucy Whiteman, but because uh, the, 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 the factory wasn't actually um, up to scratch. It wasn't caring for its workers. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, the workplace is really one of the main places where inequality is showing itself um, and where those, uh, you know, minority groups in particular are, are really facing the consequences of of, uh, of of the COVID crisis, but also the financial uh, crisis that's been overwhelmingly placed on their shoulders. Um, I think that the, the main way we're going to start tackling inequality is actually tackling things like the, equality, the, the inequality of wages um, and, and living conditions. So, uh, of course, having affordable housing is something that's, uh, you know, that is pie in the sky for a lot of people. Um, I suspect I might rent for the rest of my life. Um, certainly, I don't make £12 per hour and, and, and I've been promoted three times. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of those issues that if, if you're a member of the working class in this council, it's always going to be uh, a problem and, and not just in this council, but across the country. The first stage in tackling that is going to be workers coming together and fighting for better wages and conditions. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Stuart, you're, you're next. And for this question, I will do the reverse order to so you be first. Okay. Well, that, that's good because, of course, a lot of what I'm going to do is agree with what's already been said. So absolutely, I 100% I agree about the issue of the living wage. Uh, and that's something I've always supported. I'm very glad that uh, things are moving that way. And it's good that the also the council has been improving of late, that we might be able to do something about some of these things. Although the only reason the council is improving is because of the government appointed commissioners that have made that possible. Nothing to do with the Conservative administration. Uh, and I would like to uh, also say that what my personal beliefs on in terms of tackling inequality, there, is, there are several issues. I agree with the housing. That's uh, one big issue. Uh, and what the issue is about having the right mix of houses. So not all one type of houses in one place. So when we do build new house houses, which we should, we should make sure that they are effectively distributed and tailor-made to the local areas. And we want to have more of a committee system where we're able, rather than the cabinet system, where we're able to tailor make it a bit more to the local areas. Um, the other thing in particular for me, uh, and I'm sort of speaking on education for the Lib Dems uh, locally, is education and the need for that to help. I strongly believe in that in helping bring people out of poverty. Uh, it, one of the commissioners, by the way, pointed out that the, um, 
these children's services in Northamptonshire were the most expensive, but also one of the worst in the country. And that is something that is certainly something no one, no one should be putting up with. Uh, so what we want to do is make sure that when we move on, when we go forward into the future, that it's no longer expensive but poor, but is actually, again, as I say, tailor-made to the community and make sure that people get uh, a proper and decent service. And the other thing is there are other initiatives as well. I, I believe, for instance, in things like the citizen curriculum, the idea of using community spaces and libraries and other things that aren't being used at the moment to help people get things like basic literacy, numeracy, uh, digital uh, skills, financial skills, these sorts of things will help uh, people, perhaps if their English isn't very good as well, uh, to help them integrate a bit better and help them be able to access more work opportunities and more opportunities in general and, and opportunities in the community. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a question that was uh, asked by Georgia. Uh, and uh, she, or Georgia says, kind of, uh, I've made any effort to connect with your community, uh, e.g. speaking to residents, talking about problems, how can you fix them? Uh, and uh, to make it very, very concrete, can you tell, tell me exactly about one problem that's been raised and what you told that uh, resident about it? So Stuart, you first now. Uh, yes, of course. Um, well, we, Always make sure we, I, I listen to res residents. I've been talking to regularly on the phone of late. Uh, and we, as I said, make sure that we, we keep in touch between elections, not just at elections. So we're always listening. Um, and I've also been speaking to Europeans uh, as well and their issues. Uh, so I've already heard some of them. There are other issues as well, for instance, in terms of lack of information, for instance, on um, what their settled status is and these sorts of things. The fact is the government has not been putting much effort into communication, but in, uh, which is something I think that needs to be improved. Uh, but in terms of uh, listening to and sorting something out, well, um, recently we, I spoke to uh, someone we're talking about, very minor sort of, it seems to be a very minor issue, but uh, it was about a uh, the waste disposal of a dog, uh, dog, dog poo uh, waste disposal uh, thing on, in a field. Uh, next to a gate and they're saying that it was too close and uh, I took this up and we have plans in our um, local manifesto for instance to have uh, what we would like to do is have a new service whereby we actually go and try and fix some of these more minor issues uh, it's called the sort of uh, local steward initiative where you go around and you get a roaming handyman that will go and sort out little minor issues and things like that so that was one thing I sort of brought up and Try to try to deal with, um, and there is all sorts of other things as well that come up. Housing is a major one, um, multiple occupancy, and the problem of parking. Obviously, you can't do much about that at the moment, but I have told that our uh, what we are trying to do in terms of our initiatives to uh, again change housing so that we have a better equitable distribution of houses, so that we don't have so many multiple occupancy and so many, and therefore we'll have uh, alleviate some of the parking problems uh, in the future. So that's another, another example. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Katie, uh, so what, are, what problems the local residents telling you about? And uh, give me an example of uh, your solutions or what you told them that should happen. Um, so I've talked to people in this community for years about so many things, it'd be really difficult to pinpoint something. Um, certainly, whenever I talk about the NHS, um, there's always a, an overwhelming sense of, of fear of losing the NHS, but also uh, a, a real pride in, in um, the work that uh, the NHS are doing, um, particularly locally, you know, um, we've got a lot of NHS services. Um, I think one of the main things that we've done, I mean, bearing in mind, we, we launched this year um, as the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition. We've had some conversations as TUS candidates. Um, but one of the things I think was really important to us was the Green Corps dispute um, and, and standing up for those workers, you know, 300 workers who were um, who were who, who con contracted COVID. Um, and uh, were, were absolutely disgracefully treated in, by some in the media. And, and the, I think one of the most important things for us as, as uh, the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition was to represent those workers. Uh, and the way that we've done that um, is by, with a little bit of persuasion, um, having a task candidate who's um, who's actually in the Baker's Union and, and um, a worker at Green Corps and a, a Romanian as well, uh, in fact. And he'll be standing in St. George's Ward and hopefully um, giving a voice to those workers, but also 
given a voice to that to that section of the community that's so big in in Northampton. Um, I think that's kind of one of the main issues that we're connecting with at the moment. Um, we're also part of the the um, housing campaign um, in um, uh, in Northampton. I think it's Northamptonshire Housing Campaign, which is a new initiative, and definitely we would support anybody um, to get involved in that um, if you you know agree with what we stand for. We're just at the starting point at the moment um, in Northampton, um, but you know the, the the ideas are to go well beyond the election period. Thank you, Katie. Jonathan, what's your answer to that uh, question about uh, connecting to the community, problems may arise, and why you tell people directly with a specific yeah. issue if you can... Uh, yeah, very happy to. Just just quickly, if I may, pick up on a couple of things. I think I probably failed to explain. Question from Al in the chat is about uh, how many of these houses are council houses. Everything I've referred to, Al, is a council house. The 1,000 houses uh, with, the, with the 200 that are being built, the 500 or whatever that are on site, are council houses. Oh, oh and, and quickly to Dimitri's question above... Um, I think there's a bit of prejudice and assumption in your question. Nine pounds is about my hourly rate for this job, actually, just so, just so you're aware. Um, in terms of specific issues, we're probably an advantage, Danielle and I as councillors, because you do get people come to you already. And I, I'll handle every day queries on fly tipping, um, queries on housing when people have got a really desperate housing housing need and so on. I, I think the general point I'd make, because it's easy to answer, I can give you a long list of individual people. And, and actually, that's the great part about the job. I'd say two things, though. I do think you get you get better decisions when people are involved. So in terms of coming back to a point, I think it was Stuart that made it earlier, committee system. I think actually committees rather than cabinets are a better way approach rather than a bunch of individuals making decisions and everybody else just standing there to either watch them or criticise them. Why not get everybody involved in, in committees? You get people across all parties who have their view. And we took this same approach on some consultations. First of all, we recently did a consultation on the town master plan. And for the first time ever, we not only did it online, but we had it published in the newspaper. We even delivered leaflets to doctor surgeries and, and all sorts of things, because I believe the more people you get on board with the decision, the better. The first First consultation I did was two or three days after I got the job where we were about to do something with the waste contract and replace an adequate service that was uh, offered previously by a firm called Enterprise uh, and I insisted that we stalled the process to ask people what they thought and nine and a half thousand people which is record-breaking for a council consultation replied and told us what they thought but but the last thing I would say it feels really good to help people through casework. It really does. When you get somebody approach you in a bad situation and you get the chance to help, naturally it feels really, really good. Actually, what I hope we've been able to do at Northampton Borough Council the last few years is not just do that in, as individuals, as indeed councillors from all sides do. I, I know they do. All councillors are dedicated to sort people's problems out. But actually, if we really want to be good, and what I hope we've achieved in the last few years, is we haven't just fought for the individual people who have got in touch with me or Danielle. Actually, we've created processes to deal better with everybody's problems, from fly tipping to housing, etc. And actually, that's probably more the mark of success, not just individual champions helping two or three people who they happen to know, but actually creating services that are good for everybody, so that if you go through the process, you, you get a great service. I think that, above all, would be my aspiration for the new council. Sorry, I digressed a bit there, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, a lot of agreement, actually, across the board. Daniel, are you on the same, uh, same level with, uh, with Jonathan on these questions? I, I've been a community activist all my life and a councillor for 10. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've spent a lifetime um, engaging with communities and trying to support individual people. But more than that, trying to learn from them what needs to change and then being part of the movement that helps that change. So two things that I'm involved in. I'm the trustee of the um, Association of Northamptonshire Supplementary Schools. We've got lots of Eastern European classes going on in, in Northamptonshire and I'm really, really passionate about that because I think our children need to keep their mother tongue, they need to keep their language, they need to keep their traditions. And that makes them stronger citizens in, in terms of going out into the world and being proud of who they are. So I'm very, very passionate about that. It also means that parents have got a meeting place and they can get lots and lots of support. So that's really close to my heart. The other thing that I do is I, I'm a founder member of Northampton Town of Sanctuary, which is hoping to make um, the local authority and all its institutions 
in the town welcoming to refugees. And as part of that, I helped run a youth club for, for youth uh, from all over the globe who are refugees in, in Northamptonshire. And all of that is really important to me, but working very locally, I, I'm the council of the town centre. We have huge issues with fly tipping there. We've embarked on a campaign to stop fly tipping. And what we're doing there is putting in great big planters, which neighbours and local people are looking after. And we're growing herbs and vegetables and flowers in those planters on the spots where all the fly tipping happens. And we're doing a massive um, increase. We're seeing a massive increase in those planters in, in the next few weeks, actually, in, in the middle of town. So I think, you know, a mix of doing very local things, but also having very strategic things to help uh, move things along is really important to me. Thank you, Daniel. So we're going to go back to the, the, the first order for the answer. And uh, so there's quite a few questions on uh, council taxes. Uh, so from uh, the Northampton Chronicles, kind of, uh, uh, it was advertised that uh, there's a tax rise of 4.99% uh, this year. And uh, one of the questions was uh, regarding the fact that new councillors got come in uh, after this election, uh, where they'd have a say in the tax rise. So why the tax rise? Can we expect better services? Uh, and uh, is, is there any plan to continue the tax rises over the coming years? Daniel, you first. Okay, thank you. Really, really important um, question. And no, we're not going to be getting any better services for that tax rise. And the tax rise is nearer the 6% mark when we add in the precept from the police and lots of other things as well. Um, oh, my, my phone's about to conk out. Um, what should we be doing about it? The sad fact is that central government has for years and years and years underfunded local authorities and most local authorities are now in really serious trouble. And the only place they've got to go for money is people like us and, and from businesses. I think that's entirely wrong. And I think local authorities need to be developing income generation strategies and they should be looking much more creatively about how they're going to bring money in. Yes, we need more government funding, but we need to be um, not so reliant on council tax and on business rates. We need to look further afield than that. And of course, for our money, we should be expecting really good services, which we don't have at the minute. Thank you, Daniel. Jonathan. Yeah, th thank you, Nicholas. Um, uh, I mean, uh, my view is we've got to demand better from the new council. I mean, just a quick word on this. I don't think in Northampton many of us really wanted a unitary West. Uh, in fact, I, I was one of the many, I think pretty much all councillors at Northampton and Danielle will, will support this too. We, we would have preferred a Northampton unitary. We asked that question. The government said no four times. In, in the end, we've got what we've got. It's been two years of upheaval to create it, uh, along with the natural disturbance that is responding to COVID has caught. And my constant mantra is, after all this upheaval, it has got to be better. Now, in terms of how it will be, and in terms of the funding, Danielle's dead right, gov government funding to some extent reduces. So uh, councils used to get a sort of support grant, which they no longer get. Um, so it does put more of the onus on them to provide that local funding. And it's a real squeeze because you have a limit to how much you can raise. You have statutory services that you have to deliver. Sometimes it's really hard to find any funding for the things you really want to do just to make should we say the town better? That, that genuinely is a real problem. Now, in, in, in the New West, the, the council tax reduction scheme, which does at least provide some comfort for those people very low on the income scale, it, 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 it is retained. And broadly across the West, there's been some improvements to that, along with a couple of other things, such as the care leavers. And again, Danielle's lobbied for this, and I, I'm glad we've been able to do it, which is where um, care, care leavers Get, get significant relief to their to their council tax uh, basically but it is it is an increase one thing we can say here in Northampton is that ours will increase less because actually the others in other parts have got to do some catching up there are things that 
are, are spent and paid for by Northampton Borough Council that other councils weren't and, and now people will need to equalise up to our level but it does seem to be the future it does seem to be the trend and all I'd say to people is uh, yes the, the budget will be in place so if anybody here is thinking of being a councillor and they are elected they won't have had the choice that had to be in place beforehand there's always consultation and lobby your local councillor for what you think should be included and shouldn't but as a local councillor anybody here who's not who then finds themselves they will to some extent feel their hands are tied by what they have to do within that budget uh, and things they have to provide similar things are parking charges you know wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to pay to come and park in the town i would love to do that and we you know conservatives would like to think they're the party of supporting local businesses and towns i would love to be able to do that it just is not possible uh, on park car parks you have to pay business rates there are costs to, costs to run them and it just is not possible to reduce that parking charge and i have to say two ideological things i'll say here one I don't happen to believe that those who aren't, uh, who can't afford to run a car should pay for parking for those who can. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think we should completely cut car parking charges and load it on other people. The other thing I would say is something where Danielle knows she and I are slightly different. I, I get the need to be entrepreneurial. It's, it's probably in my genes. I grew up in a family who ran small businesses. My ideological concern always about this is about councils taking risks, or actually it's about councils using cheap public money to compete with um, you know the, work, the working man and woman actually or, or the pension fund if, if you're investing in a pension fund you know should the council use cheap money to to go into a commercial building where otherwise your legal and general pension might have done so there are some ideological trips in there my hope would always be that the council tax can be as low as it possibly can and that, that that's always got to be a key a key driver for any council good Katie Katie Thanks very much. Um, it's interesting hearing Jonathan talking about ideology. Um, I think one of the, the ideological mistakes of this council has been to try and make a quick buck by selling off assets um, that if we still had would mean that actually we wouldn't need to be uh, increasing taxes and, and, and cutting services. Um, we've been seeing that happening across Northamptonshire. Um, T council tax increases um, mean they mean that, like Danielle said, that the citizens are paying more for less. And that's been the case for a long time. And I think they're completely unnecessary. Um, I do agree with Danielle that, you know, national government has underfunded local councils. And that's one of the big issues. What I don't agree with um, from uh, Labour councillors is the, the inaction that, that they've had in terms of um, actually standing up to the austerity measures that have been forced by this council. Um, what councillors should be doing is what the militant council did uh, in Liverpool in the 1980s, rejecting national funding cuts uh, and instead raising um, uh, the uh, uh, funds and uh, sorry. I've misread what I've written. Um, rejecting national funding cuts uh, and instead of raising taxes, uh, cutting services um, and 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 uh, the, the what the Liverpool, the council did in Liverpool in 1980s was was to um, to build council housing to to create services that made money for the council. By the way, um, this wasn't just about spending money they didn't have. Um, building uh, uh, council houses and, and local services, and, and by the way, this isn't illegal. Um, uh, it's even less illegal now than it was in the 80s. Um, but if it were illegal, uh, the argument remains the same as it did then. It's better to break the law than to break the poor. Um, the, the economy is not uh, it's not some monster that needs to be fed, you know, otherwise it's going to attack the, 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 the country, you know, the economy, the whole point in the economy is it's supposed to be run in the interests of ordinary people. It's supposed to be so that people don't starve to death and so that people don't live in, in substandard housing and that people don't have to work uh, three jobs and, and 80 hours a week just to get by. The whole point in an economy is it's supposed to run, uh, you know, the the society that we need to thrive and, and if an economy can't do that the problem isn't that we can't afford these services and these 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 benefits that we need the problem is that that we can't afford the system that's letting us down and not providing those things for us and um, so I, I i disagree with council tax increases i think there's much better ways of spending money i think you, one of the first places we can start is to scrap these pfi schemes most of them have already been paid they're just getting paid interest now they're just getting that little extra for for the 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 the, the, the often substandard stuff that they've uh, built or created or running so um there's there's much better ways of, of spending um and, and and raising money than than raising council taxes on people who are already struggling 
Thank you, Katie. Stuart, you're next. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting we're hearing the words of ideology being thrown around, which I hate ideology in all its forms because rigid belief systems tend to blink you to think outside and look at other people's point of view, which I, as an academic, I weigh up evidence, I go on evidence, and that's what I think all people in electable councils should do. Uh, although what's been said, a lot of been said, a lot, a lot of what's been said is true. Uh, there has been problems of funding uh, for funding from local uh, from national government, and there also has been problems with ideological decisions on the council to farm out services to local charities and organisations, keep taxes artificially low, in the extent of in the, on the county council it is, and that's why we're landing with this huge tax bombshell now. And that's and 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 the simple answer is you will not be getting better services because of that, and that's extremely unfortunate. Uh, and and what we really need to be doing is trying to do what we can with, with what we've got, basically. Uh, so uh, in terms of the community, we do need to try and attract as many new businesses as possible. We do have as a unique location. We are within pretty much four hours of, mo of pretty much the entire country. So we are an extremely useful location to attract business. So that should be there and should be, should be, should be utilised. Uh, and we should be trying to, again, encourage people to use the town centre more. Uh, I agree on the parking charges. I think that, um, and I think it was mentioned on the chat actually about the fact Wellingborough has no parking charges and it creates a more vibrant, vibrant centre. And I think that that is true. Uh, and really, we just need to, as I say, try and um, li listen to people and actually try and tailor make our, our decisions, weighing up the evidence of what is best for the community and try and try and fix the hole that we've got because the council tax is, is mainly trying to fill a black hole that's been created. So we have to try and try and do what improvements we can with, the, with those problems we've inherited. So thank you very much. So uh, it's uh, 5.53 and uh, we want to finish on time. It's good practice. So we're gonna quickly do one question on the EU citizens in Northampton and then you will all have one minute each to do your sales speech to uh, the, the electors. Um, more than 10% of the population in Northampton uh, comes from uh, the EU. Uh, there's a deadline for applying for civil status on the 30th of June. Not everyone is aware of this. What would you do to make sure that all your citizens in Northampton are aware of the deadline and apply on time? So Stuart, you're first on it. Absolutely, I already touched on this a bit, which is the fact that I think the big problem with what EU citizens knowing about their own rights and about the current situation is, is a lack of information. And I think that is key. We need to try and promote as much as possible uh, information, sources of information. I would like, if possible, to do a mail shot to everyone in the, uh, in the area to try and get them to know their rights. That would be one thing I would like to do. It's been done for all sorts of other things. Why can't it be done for this? So, uh, to, because you don't want people falling through the cracks, because the fact is the system is very complicated. It's, it's a bit like the government's COVID uh, rules. You don't really know where you are. Things change all the time. And people don't really know what they, you know, what they are and aren't entitled to. Um, so that that would be my sort of solution to the, the problem. And I say I think it is mainly a problem of information. Thank you, Stuart. Katie. So um, firstly, I don't think EU citizens should even be having to apply for citizenship status in the first place. I I. I disagree fundamentally with it however that is the reality that they're facing um so the most important thing again is to, to use council uh, funds um appropriately to help get the message out and to support those communities um you know a council that's connected with uh, its citizens would know you know where these areas are where um these workplaces are where eu citizens are living um there's uh, there's no reason why there couldn't be a, a connection with workplaces to help get the message out um, about how uh, people can go about applying for citizenship. Um, but I think this deadline is too soon. I think the deadline needs to be extended. Um, again, so it's out of our control. Um, so uh, the, it's, I think it's on the, the council to, to make sure that the, um, the, the message is out through whatever means necessary and whatever expense is necessary. Because uh, like it's been said, you know, the, 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 the citizens in this, in this uh, county who are, um, Eastern European make up not just a massive portion, um, but they're really important. These are vital key workers. A lot of them in in this uh, in this situation we have, um, 
so um, that would be my position. But I think the council should uh, try its best to also give some some leniency. And if if there are people who have who have not got to the deadline in time, not to throw them under the bus, um, like has been happening during this whole Brexit fiasco. Thank you, Katie. Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. I mean, it's a soon. It is an urgent deadline, isn't it? Coming up end of June, I think it is. So it doesn't seem to give much time. And I think that, you know, that, that it's unfortunate that it, it is so close. I think there is a role here for councils to promote uh, things like this. It's a general sort of, you know, publicly important message, isn't it? So so we should get that out. I'm hearing a lot about don't increase council tax, but do this, do this, do this. It costs around about 30,000 to send a letter to every all the 93,000 homes in the um, in the town. I think that's probably not a bad idea at actually we thought the wasting was important enough to do that so so it's not without precedent certainly i think there's a place there for the, the councils to do something about that we at the borough council have built quite strong networks into a variety of different communities actually of course covid has been a key part of that where we've even sought to ask communities to uh, to produce information with us and translate so that it makes sure it, it 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 reaches all those sort of communities so i think through that network and our social media networks is the answer uh, is the answer to do it and I, i'd accept it is a role for the council to take it on i think can I at that point, Nicholas, apologise, I must be on time for this meeting at six and it's this, it's one of these formal set piece meetings I mentioned when I, uh, when, when I sort of signed up with Andres. So with my apology, I'm going to dip off if I may. Can I thank everybody who's been here to listen and, and indeed colleagues, if I can call you colleagues on the screen who have participated as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Bye -bye. Daniel. Thank you. I do think councils have got a role to play, but I think community organisers and faith groups do as well. So this Thursday, I've got a meeting with the supplementary schools and I think they are a really good conduit for lots of information to go out. A part of uh, the fabric of support that they weave for the communities are the churches. So we've got a very big, very strong Polish church in Northampton. And we've got a very big um, a Romanian church in Northampton as well. So I think those are the kind of avenues that I would explore. And I will talk to people about it on Thursday at the meeting to see if we can get lots of information directly out to households um, through those avenues. I think in terms of the council, it's not just about direct mails. It's about having access to legal support, isn't it? Getting advice in a timely way for when you need it. So I think that is something that the council could set up in our one-stop shop to, to give European citizens the advice that they need to help them on their way. Thank you, Daniel. So we are coming to, to an end. I'm really sorry, many, many questions couldn't be answered. It's a short format. There's gonna be other things from other organizations. So anyone that's got more questions, attend the other things. We're organizing a similar event for Corby, another event for Peterborough. So we're trying to mix uh, our events. So to end, uh, I will ask the three remaining candidates to do a very short one minute pitch to the electorate, uh, starting in the order of Daniel, Katie and Stuart, and then Robert can have the final uh, words as a, a young Europeans living in Northampton. So Daniel, your first one minute. One of the things that's really important to me is community organising and people finding a, a voice and a platform so that we can hear from them what their needs are and they can help us shape the services that they need. I think we need to do a lot more in terms of participatory democracy. We need to do a lot more in terms of participatory budgeting. We need to close the gap between the politicians and the people. Thank you, Daniel. Katie. So uh, this 6th of May, um, we've got five candidates standing for the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition, but that's just the start. Um, and we do want to have more candidates standing in the future. Um, in the meantime, you know, we'd, we'd really like some more support for what we're doing. We're offering an alternative because we're offering a genuine no cuts uh, alternative. Um, 
and uh, once the election is is complete we're going to continue going we'd really like people to get involved um you know when we talk about participation this isn't just about you know uh, climbing up the ladder of, of careerist politics this is about fighting on the ground in your workplaces um and, and on the streets to to build something that's actually going to fight back against not just a you know a tory council that's been letting us down time and again but a, a national government that's been letting us down so absolutely give tusk your vote um and but get in touch and, and support us we're on facebook we've got uh, an email address there you can get in touch we're on twitter now so um so please do get in touch and give us your vote on 6th of may thank you katie stuart uh, i'd like to echo a lot of the sentiments actually have already been uh, mentioned particularly in terms of uh working on with the community and listening to people and more participation uh, in that sense, I would like to see the council use use more things like citizens' assemblies, particularly for really emerging problems like uh, green issues, uh, and sort out climate emergency. I've talked about the battle we aim to have zero net uh, carbon targets by 2030, for instance, and we've, we've committed ourselves to. Um, we and we've also mentioned about the fact of um, the belief that working with people and working with people from other parties as well. That's what I actually agree on. That is a, a really a really good way of going forward and going past the sort of partisan ways the, the council's been done before, which is partly why a lot of the problems have happened. Uh, and I'd like to think that, like I've said before, we, 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 we listen to people and we try and take those on board and we try and listen to other, other, other parties as well. Uh, we will try and work for people. We will try and um, actually implement ideas and uh, suggestions that are given to us. Uh, we will build on our record of local competence as well. And give you actual value for money and good services which is what a lot of people want and to make sure that we can move on and improve the council uh, from the dark days that have gone before us so i hope you consider voting for the liberal democrats on may 6th thank you studs i really want to thank all the candidates for uh, coming on that uh, webinar democracy is true alive when people are uh, you know, taking part, joining the debate, and uh, it's at all level, you know, the people are actually being, being a candidate is not always easy, and uh, so I really appreciate, and thank you for all attendees. I'm going to leave the last words to Robert, kind of, uh, because this is a young event, uh, uh, event. I'm not young anymore, I wish I was, so uh, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, Nicholas. So um, I would just like to begin by saying uh, thank you to Nicholas and thank you to Andras and Alexandra for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, certainly as a, a young person, I don't really uh, feel very engaged in politics. Um, and certainly as a young EU citizen, I certainly do not feel very engaged in politics. And so I think this has been a great opportunity for me to come down and uh, really participate. Likewise, Multiple occupancy is definitely an issue that has been brought up and all the candidates have spoken about. Um, we know families who either live in either in multiple occupancy, um, who are in multiple occupancy or who have lived in multiple occupancy. And sometimes we, when we talk, we think, you know, maybe we're so lucky that we haven't had to go through that because it re really is not nice. And sometimes we think, you know, why should we feel lucky that we haven't had to live with other families? And so I think that is something which definitely affects a lot of European people. And so I'm really glad that the candidates have brought that up. Similarly, inequality is a massive issue, not just in the UK as a whole, but also in Northampton. And so I'm glad that that has also been addressed. Um, I'm also happy to hear that all the candidates have said that they are willing to engage with the European community in Northampton. Um, as has been said, you know, about 10% of the population is, uh, you know, are EU citizens. And the thing is, we are a crucial part of the community because we're not just workers as we, you know, are often portrayed. We are also your friends, you're also your colleagues, and we're also your neighbours. And I'm glad to hear that a lot of people um, have reached out to the community and that there is support available. And I, um, I would be really glad to hear um, more being done by the council to reach out to the community. And um, if you are listening to this and you have not yet registered for, um, to vote for the local elections, uh, please go to www.ourhomeourvote.co.uk and register. It takes five minutes. It is really simple and there are so many advantages to it. Uh, but I guess with that, I would like to thank 
you all again for giving me the opportunity and I would like to thank the candidates for giving their time to come and speak to us. Thank you very much.